Thank you very much for joining me today and uh, welcome to approach uh, your well-being with an agile mindset. Let's dive in. Yeah. Once upon a time, mental health conditions were considered a punishment from God. During many centuries, society didn't treat people suffering from mental health conditions any better than they treated common criminals. They were imprisoned, they were tortured, and they were killed. One of the most infamous asylums is actually, or was, here in London, based here in London, not far from where we are actually, in the city of London. And it wasn't until the Enlightenment era, around the 17th, 18th century, when actually institutions were started to be created to look after people suffering from mental health problems. This is Philippe Pinel, and he was the first person that actually revolutionized all this. He actually had the theory, he had the hypothesis, and he took over this um, asylum in the outskirts of uh, Paris to test it. Guess what the hypothesis was? So he thought that if we actually look after mental health, uh, people suffering from mental health conditions with care, kindness, and considerations, they will actually get better. Ground thinking memory. This was amazing. During the centuries and during the, the times, stigma about mental health um, illness has been up and down. And now there is a massive movement to talk about it. Everybody's talking about it. From Prince Harry to your HR departments, everybody talks about it. And this is very good. All of the companies, or most of the companies, are creating spaces for people to talk about it. But is it enough? Are we doing enough? Can we do more? Nine out of 10 people suffering from mental health conditions say that actually discrimination is really affecting their lives and it can make their conditions worse. Let me ask you a question. What do you think has happened to the global suicide rate in the last 20 years? Yes? <laughs> Raise your hand if you think it has decreased about 25%. No one. Raise your hand if you think it has to stay about the same. A couple of you. Raise your hand if you think it has increased about 25%. Woo, wow, all of you. I've got news. It has actually decreased by 25%. This is very good news. So talking about it is working. And because everybody's talking about it, we feel like it's massive, but actually it's not, it does help. Obviously looking after people with kindness and consideration probably also help too. And I'm going to tell you a story. I don't know about you, but the, during the pandemic, I really, really struggled. Anyone? Yeah. But I didn't realize how bad until I have one meeting that really, really took me over. Actually, it knocked me down. And I had to take some time off. I am a mental health face there, so I thought I had to look after people. I was supporting people, listening to their problems, giving them information. And I didn't realize how bad I was till that meeting. My anxiety was over the roof. But I had this terrible headache, and usually I suffer from migraines. But I couldn't do anything to stop this headache. It was different, it wasn't the same. My legs were having a party. It's like they were having a life of their own. I would be lying on the sofa or lying in bed, and my legs were going. I couldn't control the spasms. And then obviously you don't want to wake up your partner and that makes you more anxious, so your legs move even more. <laughs> no good, no good at all. 
So I was thinking to myself, how did I allow myself to get to this point? What can we do about this? And then we realized, actually, I'm not alone. In my company, this is the spectrum of mental health, of interventions for mental health, but the source is Mental Health First Aid England. The, the things at the bottom is from them, the things at the top is my observation. So what happened during the pandemic is like nobody was taking holidays. We couldn't go anywhere. So why are you going to take holidays? Let's keep on working. And suddenly you realize, woman, if you don't make time for your wellness, you're going to be forced to make time for your illness. So what can we do about this? And the thing that really shocked me is that I wasn't alone. There was a lot of people suffering from the same. And I remember seeing people that they were very assertive, people that they were really good, people that were directing teams, suddenly losing their confidence, not being able to speak or stand in a meeting. And it was really, really discouraging, really discouraging. So I started thinking, can we use what we know about Agile and our world to actually help us? What can we do? Why can't we at, at kind of attack our problems in an iterative way? You know, one bit at a time and see what happens. Why can't we look after ourselves like we look after our teams? And why can't we put our needs first like we do our customers? Hmm. And this is how the five A's were born. So let's jump into it. The first A is acknowledge. And this is the first step and is the most important. We need to be true to ourselves, how we are and what we feel. This step reminds me of the Hollywood blockbusters when the, the main character is having problems, perhaps substance abuse. And everybody around their people, they are telling them, you have a problem. You have to do something about it. And you keep saying, no, it's all OK. I'm all right. All good. I've got it under control. Don't worry. It's fine. And then suddenly, they have this aha moment. And they realize, shit, I have a problem. I need to do something about it. So when somebody asks you, are you OK, and you are not OK, don't say, I'm OK. You say, you know what? Actually, I don't know if I'm depressed, because that's a medical term, right? But I'm not right. There is something wrong. I'm not myself. Cool. The second A stands for accept. I am what I am. And this one took me quite a bit to master and understand the importance of it. And I can hear you say it. But if I'm acknowledging it, for sure I'm accepting it, right? Not quite. Not quite. This step reminds me of the um, um, retrospective prime directive. That is all about no blame, no judgment. So for this to work, it's exactly the same. You cannot blame yourself. You cannot blame others. You cannot blame the circumstances the environment, you just take it like it is. So remember what I was saying before, how can I get myself get to this? Don't, it is what it is. What are you going to do about it? Accept it. And why don't we use an agile mindset to actually help us? So from unhelpful thoughts, from a fixed mindset to a balanced response, from an agile mindset. Things like, and this is based on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I don't know if you know this. But things like, I cannot feel any better because I have too many problems. This reminds me what our teams come to us and they say to me, I can visualize my work because I have too much work. Well, that's precisely why you should be doing it, right? So this is the same. OK, you know what? I will take a day at a time, set a small goals for myself, and more importantly, I will allow myself time to get over this. 
or there is no point, I cannot change the situation. Well, actually, I will make an effort to change what I don't like and accept what I cannot change. But at least I can change my unhelpful thoughts, right? And the last one is very typical too. Someone somewhere knows all the answers and they will tell me what to do. Well, there is no solution a way forward that is going to cure all my problems. So, you know, getting better involves effort and involves time. And I don't know if this is going to work, but at least I try it. You will never know. The fourth step is assess. And this is think, analyze, evaluate, assess, ring in any bells. This is our inspect and adapt step, right? So this is what we will see, how we're doing, what we're doing, is it working, is it not working, should I stop, should I start, or is holding me back? And to help us with this, we have the ABC model, because obviously this is not like a normal retrospective as well. So the ABC model stands for A, activating active, active event, and this is the event that triggers us. And when we are triggered, when something triggers, we have thoughts and we have feelings. B stands for beliefs, and it's all about your thoughts, what went through your head when the event happened. And C is about consequences. What were the actions? What did you do? What were the emotions? What did you feel? This will help you understand the situation. But also, at this step, is when we are going to start bringing and, and building our toolbox. So as agile coaches, uh, scrum masters, product owners, designers, product managers, everybody has their own kind of artifacts and things that we use in certain situations. When we want to solve a problem, we go through a retrospective because we know that has worked in the past. So this is about the same. It's about creating a toolbox that is going to help us when we are bad or when we are getting bad. And this will be dividing you. Just put your triggers in one side. What are the early signs? Or what are the things that you know that trick you? I'm breaking it down into three areas. When things are well or getting a bit bad, when you are in a crisis, and this is very important, when you are in a crisis, you need to make sure that you put the, the size of the, of the crisis because it's not the same if you have a small one or if you have a big one. You will use different tools that will work for you if it's big or if it's small. I put here a small, medium and large, but you can put a small and big or whatever works for you. But make sure that you have different techniques for different kind of uh, grades of crisis. And finally, post-crisis. So this is when you are coming out, when you are recovering. Things that you need to avoid, for example, or things that have helped you in the past. The next A is about applying it. And this is about running your, oh, sorry, I have forgot something. On this, uh, on this assess bit, and is that during the pandemic as well, we had a lot of um, kind of guides on how to look after yourself, how to look after your mental health, 10 things that uh, important people do, and five things that successful people do. And that one's really, really upset me, because I was trying them, <laughs> they were not working. Or there were normal things like, go for a walk. I do that, I'm still here. So what do I do? It's like, don't worry, you know. You, you try them, it works for you, to the toolbox. They don't work, you send them apart. You are not alone, it is normal. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. And that's why you have to really build your own. And then the next steps that you have decided on the previous step, on assess, you actually run them like an experiment, like you run the experiments for your teams. So you set your hypothesis, you define your time frame, you define how you're going to say that you are progressing 
or that you are winning, that this is working for you and it's not. And then make sure you focus and make sure you keep it simple. You don't want to tackle too much. The last step, ask for help. It's not the step as such. It's more what it binds everything together. Ask for help is probably the most difficult step out of everything. And there are several reasons for it. And in here, we sometimes feel kind of compelled to maybe I should tackle this on my own, you know. Why am I going to ask for help? And the reasons why this is very difficult is because first, society has always or more or less told us that actually asking for help is a sign of weakness. Now there is a change. Everybody's saying, okay, no, asking for help is a sign of leadership. It's a sign of courage. And what we're seeing in other people, we say, wow, look at them. They, they have balls to come out and say these things, right? But it's always something about us that kind of stop us from doing it. And that might be because we think that we are going to be a burden for people and we don't want to be a burden. Or simply because we feel the same. Don't. Don't feel the same. And it's always okay to ask for help, always. Ask your friends, ask your family, ask your colleagues, you know, all the institutions, and I have put some links in here. Ask your God if you have one, the universe, if that works for you, whatever. But don't be afraid to ask for help. I don't know if you guys know Demi Lovato. She's a singer, yeah. actress. She's very vocal, actually, about her problems with eating disorders, with mental health. And she once says that if she had to give advice to people going through a rough patch, it will be never to be afraid to ask for help. So that's the most important thing. Always ask for help. There are other institutions that, you know, there are multiple, so if you need help finding one, if you want more information, come back to me later and I'll send you some information. But there are some that they go to particular problems or mental health conditions. Those ones that I put in there, they are kind of the, the bigger ones that they go generic. And this is again, just closing down the spectrum of intervention. Now, this is what the five phase work well. When you are well and when you're recovering unwell. You can use them when you are unwell and when you are recovering. But there, is, there are no in any way, shape or form, a substitution for treatment. If you need treatment, you have to go to a professional. And this is something that I noticed as well. When we were at work, there were people that they were coming to me saying, oh, I've got problems sleeping, I'm not sleeping well. What do you recommend? Do you have any? And then after a while talking, you realize, holy moly, I think you need to go to professional because this is out of my depth. I can't really, you know, I'm not a professional. So please, you need to. And then you find out that these people have massive, massive depression and they are being treated for it. So it is not a substitution for treatment, yes. You said, yeah. So for finishing, it is very important that we re regulate our thoughts by our behaviors. And uh, this is going to help us to actually achieve our goals, to control our brain a little bit more. Don't try to put your emotions behind or hide them because they are going to come back and probably harder than they were there before. Don't try to analyze them because emotions are worth their own kind of conference as well. They are huge. <laughs> One thing that we notice is that people during the pandemic, they couldn't name their emotions at all. Don't get stuck with that. Just put how you're feeling. Don't try to put the name. There is this wheel of emotions that you can agree or disagree. There are a lot of words in there. But sometimes it's even harder. Okay, which one I'm feeling? This one or this one? Or is it this one? 
Just put whatever it is and try to name it if you don't know it, okay? So just a little recap before we finish with the five phase. Acknowledge, make sure that you are true to yourself. Accept, this is all about no judgment, no blame. Assess, make sure that you know you do your own retrospective. Apply, run them as an experiment. And always, always ask for help. And remember that this is an iteration, so keep on going and going and going and going and going. So, thank you very much. My name is Samaya Lassa. Do you have any questions for me today? Yeah. What questions do you have? None. <laughs> I left you all silence. <laughs> We're convinced. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, if you try it, please contact me and tell me what it worked for you. Because, um, you know, on all these uh, lists and everything, I remember once seeing this, uh, I think it was an interview with uh, Elon Musk's uh, brother. And uh, he was saying that what he does is he beats X. Now, you won't see this on any of those lists. And he is very successful. He owns a chain of restaurants. He's you know, an early investor in PayPal and all this stuff. You know, so he's pretty successful, but you won't see that anywhere. And this is why it's so important that you use your own things, what works for you, rather than what somebody else is telling you. Yes? I like very much that you provided us with uh, like a form that we can really just take it. Because you know, you can really apply it in any business. I mean, I work who get very stressed out, you know, yeah. not talk about it ever. Totally. If they had a form like this, we could just say S-M-O-L or draw some, yeah, perfect, thank you. That's really thank important. you very much. I hope it helps. Yes? How would you encourage people to ask for help? Oh, that is a very, very, very good question. Uh, you just pro provide a safe environment, quite frankly. Because people is not asking for help because they don't think it's cool or because they don't feel safe and because they think they are going to be a burden. So make sure that they feel okay with that. Make sure that they don't feel the same as well. It's okay to be not okay. So if you provide that environment, people will ask for help. And what I noticed during the pandemic actually was like people will not ask for help publicly, but they will reach out to you on the back. They will ask for help. Maybe not, you know, in the meeting with the whole team, but they will speak to you. They will send you an email or make sure that you, you tell them that it's okay to come to you with whatever it is, no matter what. And when they don't, I think one good thing to do as well is to admit yourself, you know, and say, look, even I am struggling. Oh, that comes the barrier. totally, totally. If you feel vulnerable and you present yourself as, you know, it's okay not to be okay people start relating to you as well. And they will say, okay, so if she's not okay, I'm not allowed as well, right? Yeah, totally, that's a very good one. Yes? If you were comfortable with it, would you consider making this a public thing? Uh, you know, make it visible that you are going through this cycle on yourself? Oh, yeah, and I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I used this on myself when I was when it knocked me down, actually, when I realized, oh, I'm, I'm you know, mental health is say that I'm helping everybody. And then I realized, shit, you are in the shit and the same as everybody else. You need to do something about it. So why are you going to do about it, woman? So yeah. And I talk to people and I tell them, this is how I feel. I'm talking about it now. <laughs> you know, when my legs were going like crazy and it was really, really scary. It's like, shit, how, how can this happen? They are moving on their own. This is very scary stuff. So yeah, totally. And you're open about that in the workplace as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No problems. But that's me. Other people might feel not comfortable. But if you are sharing, as she was saying, you open the space for people to be able to share it as well. So don't be afraid. Feed the first ones. <laughs> yes. Really, really inspirational. Can I see the toolbox again? That was really interesting. Yeah. 
Let me move back. Yeah. I was just interested in how you broke things down into small parts, you know, patch out like that. So the part in crisis, that's what you, that's what you do in a crisis? is the, the techniques or the mechanisms that you have to actually calm you down or to stop you or to help you on those crises. So I had a friend, for example, that she used to have panic attacks. So it depends on how big the panic attack was, she had tools that she used to kind of calm down and come out of that panic attack. Yeah? It is important because then you will start to recognize patterns. Mm. So you actually will see it happening before it happens mm. and you can do something about it and prevent it. So that's why it's important. You might not get there at the beginning. At the beginning, we'll be probably dealing when you are in crisis, so having things to actually help you. But then you start having, oh, I'm recognizing this. This is what happened last time, right? It's like, OK, I'm not going to allow myself to get in there. Calm down now. What, what shall I do here? What shall I try before it happens? So that's why it's good to recognize it, so you can see those patterns arising. Yeah? Well, you can visualize it in a lot of ways, and it's very good to actually put it down. Journaling is extremely good for people, you know, suffering from mental health or not suffering from mental health. You have to have a look of, you know, the things. But mainly, if you want to keep a track of these triggers, it's good when, when you put them down. Uh, visualize it, it's up to you. You can use spreadsheets, there are apps right now that actually help you with things like this. So it's up to you what, what works for you. Cool. Thank well, you so thank much. you.